Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Leviticus. Grace and peace to you, my friends over on this side of the room. Hi. And over here, hi. And all of you who are watching live or watching afterwards, hey, welcome to Leviticus, the gospel according to Leviticus. Um, blood, guts, and fire. That's that's what we're, we're talking about. So if you weren't around, uh, or if you were, last week, I wanted to spend just a few minutes reviewing where, where we were. Because what we did, we set it up. We set up Leviticus. Leviticus is a direct follow-up from Exodus. The end of Exodus, it just, the glory of the Lord came on the tabernacle. You start verse 1, and uh, there you go. We, we just kind of follow right after that. So what I want to do, just for a few minutes, is review where we are. Because I think the key to Leviticus is understanding the people. Um if you were here last week, we talked about, here's, here's this group of slaves in Egypt, and they were dehumanized. They were treated like dirt, lower than anything possible. And not just one group of people for a certain, certain amount of time, a few years or whatever. This is generations of dehumanization. And so these people were treated like animals, and I would assume that they had the... Um, they probably felt like animals. They had no hope. I can't imagine if being a slave and treated uh, inhumanely day after day after day after day with no break, only thing that happens is they raise the production quotas. Um, I don't know what that would do to your mind and your heart, but that's the group of people we're talking about. And as we discovered, God rescues this group of people through this conversation he has with Moses. In fact, Leviticus is a continuation of this conversation. God and Moses back and forth having this conversation. So Moses uh, was involved in the rescuing of these slave people from Egypt, and they went into the wilderness, and they went to a mountain called Sinai, and God made a covenant with them, a sacred promise that God will be faithful to them, and God asked them to be faithful to his ways. And one of the things that that God said is, I want you to be um, a, a priesthood, a, a holy group of people. Uh, you're going to be my treasured possession, but I want you to be priests. And that concept of being a priest is like key to Leviticus, because Leviticus is a very priestly type of book. And so uh, uh, that we see God's goal here. God wants a, a, a family, a nation of priests. Um and so God gives them Ten Commandments, which is to help them become anti-Egypt, help them to become the people that he created them to be, to teach them the opposite, basically, of what they learned. Because in Egypt, they learned how to worship multiple gods. They had, uh, they had a different way of life, and murder, especially from the top down, was very common. And so when God gave the Ten Commandments, it was to teach these <clears throat> slave people that don't know how to be human how to be human. And that is key because Leviticus, which seems like this, this book of rituals and this book of regimens and this book of so many details that uh, why in the world would these people need that level of detail? No, but think about it. Uh, if you've ever been in an abusive situation, if you've ever been in a toxic relationship, if you ever struggled with addiction, what uh, most psychologists, doctors say is that coming out of that relationship, coming out of that addiction, coming out of that situation, you need order. You need regimen. You need to, some structure in order to get your life back together again. So picture these slaves. They don't know how to be a human being. They don't, they don't even know what to do beyond build bricks or make bricks, right? And so God is giving them through the Ten Commandments, the Torah, the law, um, the first five books of the Bible, the, the instructions in Leviticus on how to become a human being again. Uh, the first creation was ruined. And, and you'll see in the book of Leviticus and Exodus all these numbers of seven, seven of this, seven of that, seven of this. And it's almost as God is recreating these people. And so there's a theme of creation and recreation in Exodus these slaves are becoming human beings. These slaves are being recreated just like Adam and Eve were created in the beginning. And so Leviticus is for people that they, they have been dehumanized. Uh, they've been abused. They, their life is a mess. 
and they want to get their life back on track. And so Leviticus is that pattern on how to do that. And so you're here, you're watching, and your life is a mess, and you, um, you're trying to get your life on track, trying to develop rhythms and patterns and rituals so that you can become a human being, become healthy, uh, be recreated in the image of God. That I don't want animals. Please do not take this literally. But I hope that the, the level of detail that God gives in that world can translate to some details in our own world on how we can live a faithful life and become a priest. Because that's ultimately God's goal is, is he wants all of us, to, as Peter said in the New Testament, to be a priesthood of believers, to, to represent, that's what a priest does, is represent the God, represent, show the world who this God is, be a mediator between heaven and earth. Uh, and we will see that specifically today. So that's a little bit of uh, a review, an overview. The key to Leviticus is stepping into the shoes of those slaves. If we can imagine ourselves in some way, that group of people lost, looking for direction, then Leviticus will make sense. If we're looking at it as a rule book, if we're looking at the Bible as some sort of history manual, uh, it will fail us over and over and over again, because that's not what it was intended to be. And also Leviticus, and we'll talk about this at the end, if I uh, don't like blab forever, uh, Leviticus points us to Jesus. And in these first seven chapters that we're going to talk about today, uh, there's definitely some references to a Christ figure, uh, to Jesus, uh, the fulfillment of the sacrifice. All right. So uh, in order to get started um, today, as we get into some of the sacrifices, I want to talk a little bit about the tabernacle. And I gave, I handed out a diagram, and I will, um, I will post this diagram. Um, the, di the, the tabernacle, which is explained in Exodus, it's basically a big tent with an open courtyard, and inside the tent, uh, this open courtyard, there's a smaller tent. It's basically what it is. I think we've all been to festivals, fairs, where we've seen big tents, and then there's inside the tent, there's another tent. So this courtyard has two things in it beyond the tent. It has a altar for sacrifices, and that altar is right outside the inner tent, and a basin uh, to wash. And so there really isn't a whole lot there. Uh, and then you go in the tent itself, the inner tent, and there's two sections, the holy place and then a curtain and the holy of holies. Uh, in the holy place, the first part of that inner tent, there is an incense altar, there is a table with bread on it, and there's a lampstand. Now, if you study the New Testament, all three of those ideas of a lampstand and a table with bread and incense are very Christ-like um, references. Inside the inner temple, or the inner uh, tent, is what is the Holy of Holies, which is the Ark of the Covenant, um, which is where the Ten Commandments are held. And that Holy of Holies, on top of the box, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, is the mercy seat, which uh, held the presence of God. So we went from, uh, imagine this, is the closer you go into the tent, the closer you get to God's presence. Um, and so you had this, uh, uh, anyone can come in, uh, but because of our sinfulness and uncleanness, uh, only the priests could go as far in as the holy place, and only the high priest could go in to atone for our sins all the way into the holy of holies. This is just a little overview. We really don't need that, but I, in my mind, I want us to imagine ourselves as slaves, and we get to, uh, as we do this, we get to do a sacrifice, and so we get to enter into this sacred tent area, and we get to go pretty close to God's presence, which would have been revolutionary for slaves from Egypt. I, I, it's hard for us to understand this primitive time frame where all gods had sacrifices, all gods had uh, requirements, all gods had uh, duties uh, that were expected of the followers. And in Egypt, there was every god under the sun. Uh, and, but none of those gods were relational. All those gods were very much like you think of Greek gods, you know, the fire, the lightning bolts, the, you know, you do this, we're above you, and if we don't like what you do, we'll strike you down. Or um, 
there's an unpredictability of the gods that were existed in that time. So all of the videos, it's when it goes starts getting into sacrifices here in a second, there is this, um, this is different. This god's different. And I think that because we don't know that time frame, we don't understand when we read Leviticus that all of these things are different than the normal lowercase god, g gods that were around in that time. So these slaves that felt worthless could draw close to this, uh, who were never able to draw close to any gods in Egypt. This god wants you to come to him to draw close. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So there's a little bit of an overview of the, of the tabernacle. Well, that's really Exodus, but I think for us, because we're going to be talking about sacrifices today, we have to understand that we can come into the courtyard and we can come all the way to the altar. Uh, and then we will have responsibilities uh, as, as we go through these, um, these sacrifices. Um, so the tabernacle is called the tent of meeting. And the purpose of the tent of meeting is meeting. Let's keep that in mind. This is a God who wants to meet with us. All right. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about these first seven chapters of Leviticus. And in those first seven chapters, there are five sacrifices. And uh, we will kind of go through just a brief overview, and then we'll talk about them in uh, more detail. So chapter one of Leviticus is what is referred to as the burnt offering, the burnt offering. Uh, and we'll talk about why they burnt animals and what was the purpose of those uh, burnings here in a second. So Leviticus 1 is about the burnt offering. Leviticus 2 is about grain offerings. That's where they bake things or fry things, put things on griddles, they, different ways to, to bake grain. Uh, so grain offering. The third, which is Leviticus chapter 3, is uh, the peace offering. Peace offering. The Hebrew idea of shalom. It's, it's the idea of wholeness and, and, and peace. We'll talk about that more. Uh, the fourth offering is sin offering, and that's in Leviticus 4. That's when, when people commit a, a break of commandment, um, and this is a way to get, make things right. As well as the fifth offering, which is the fifth chapter, um, is guilt offering, the guilt offering, and that's Leviticus chapter 5. So we have burnt offering, great grain offering, peace offering, sin offering, and guilt offering. Now this is what it gets pretty cool, because I assumed that when God spoke to these people through Moses, he brings them all together. That's what's going on in the very first couple of verses. God, God speaks to Moses and says, hey, let's get everybody together. Uh, you think a typical God would start with sin offerings. Like, because you're a mess, this is what I want you to do. But the interesting thing in Leviticus, and this was my big aha in studying for this week, is the first three offerings, chapters 1, chapters 2, and chapter 3, are gratitude and joy offerings. They are not guilt or sin. These are offerings or sacrifices that people uh, make to God because they're happy, they're joyful, they're thankful. Now, why in the world, let's think about this, why in the world would a group of people who were once slaves, and now they're free, and now they're following this God and have the opportunity to meet with God, why would they be happy? Why would they be joyful? Why would they be grateful? Anybody have any thoughts? They're free. Yeah. They're accepted. They're loved. These are people that for the first time in their life, they have somebody that cares about them. You know what I mean? This is like really, really weird. This God is different. All the other gods, they would demand sacrifices for sin, atonement, and all of these things. Not this God. This God, he eventually gets to that. But the first three sacrifices, the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering are all gratitude, joy offerings. You ever been so uh, loved by somebody that you wanted to give somebody a gift? It's like you, your response is a gift because they love you so much. I mean, I, I remember Stacy and I's first Christmas, uh, and I still feel this way about her even more so. 
I, I just didn't want to get her one Christmas present. I did the like 12 days of Christmas thing. I just wanted to continue to give gifts to her. And I did it wrong. I did it the 12 days before Christmas instead of the, the biblical way of 12 days after Christmas. But I uh, got her a gift every day and got a bigger gift and bigger gift and bigger gift. Why? Because I love this girl. And one of the crazy things about it is she loved me, which was weird because I didn't think anybody would love me as a mess as I was and still am. But one of the responses to love is it. And those first three offerings are exactly that. This is a people who have been set free. These are a pe this, is, this is a people where God cares about them for the first time. A God that hears their cries. And the first things that God communicates through Moses to this people is okay in this new creation, this new world, this, this new way of life, you as a priesthood, the first thing is, hey, I, I want you to be able to say thank you. I want to create an environment where gratitude and joy were more important than guilt and shame. Does that make sense? So the first three are uh, gratitude, joy, peace, contentment. The last two uh, are ways when you did something wrong and you have the opportunity to make things right. Um, it's, it's the last two are helpful to show how to live, um, how to live in a society, a community in which people get along. I can't imagine what it would have been like to travel with the millions of people that were slaves. And I would imagine because of their lifestyle in Egypt, there was probably a lot of rough stuff that took place because they didn't know any better. Have you seen people in society, right? That have been treated so long, uh, bad for so long. Uh, and then they act out of that uh, damage. And so society would have been, I would imagine with a million of slaves, been very rough. And so those fourth and fifth are ways when you hurt your brother, this is a way in front of God who loves you and set you free to make things right so you can get back to being the priesthood, getting back to be the people of God. An interesting little nugget that really is not part of the study but I guess, I guess it applies, is the, the Israelites weren't known really as Israelites in that moment. They were really known as Hebrews. Uh, and the word Hebrew means nobody. A little interesting tidbit. They were nobodies. And because God loved them, they were transformed from nobodies to the people of God. Does that make sense? Have you ever felt like a nobody? Felt like nobody loved you, nobody cared about you? Felt like you messed up so much that, and so here you got these nobodies. Now they're somebodies. In fact, uh, they're, they're somebodies who their God wants them to be priests, which would have been an elevated identity in that culture, in that ancient primitive culture. You wanted to be a priest. That was a, that was a place of uh, respect and honor. And so um, they, they, God wanted them all to be priests. Um, and so uh, there's some fill in the blanks there in the middle of the page. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for sacrifice is the word korban. And that, that's used throughout these seven chapters. And the definition of that word means to draw near, to draw near. So to sacrifice an animal is to draw near to God. Um, and so even though we read the word and we read, <coughs> excuse me, slaughter, or we look at it from the blood, guts, and fire standpoint, if you look at the meaning behind these sacrifices or why people did these sacrifices, God wanted them to draw near this God we could draw near to. Um, and, and that this is a God through Jesus. We can continue to draw near to, we've been invited to boldly approach the throne of grace. Uh, so this is a God that we can draw near to. The second bullet point there is Leviticus, Leviticus invites us, invites readers to meet God. And I referenced that a little bit about the tent of meeting, to draw near, to meet with God, which is very relational. Um, the third bullet point, a sacrifice is a gift. Um, as we talked about, when, when you're drawing near to somebody, you present a gift. And, and the goal of the gift is to please the person that you're giving the gift to. So these first three um, offerings weren't, required offerings they were optional and they were given for the opportunity to give a gift to god to please god to 
uh, aroma that would be pleasant to God. Uh, and this was given from ordinary people. <coughs> these aren't gifts that are given from the, which we'll see Aaron and, the, and his boys, but these are gifts, these sacrifices were, were, were given to God from ordinary people. Um, normal people, these nobodies, they were able to give a gift directly to God. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the gods in this time were very distant. They were very detached. Uh, and people in that ancient primitive time period were going to do um, You know, you pray and sacrifice to the uh, sun god so you could have sun. You pray and, and sacrifice to the rain god so you could have rain. It, it was that kind of culture. And so that was that. And what that did is as people in that primitive culture, because of all those many gods, were, were flipping from one god to the next god to the next god to try to get their circumstances to, to go in line. And uh, it ended up those people lived with a tremendous amount of anxiety. So what was different about this god is uh, because of these seven uh, chapters, these five sacrifices that were laid out with tremendous amount of detail, um, you could, you know where you stand with this God. You can know where you stand. That's that last bullet point. Uh, you know your, you know where you are with this God. You don't have to wonder with the God, uh, which would have been incredibly different in a world of anxiety with wondering or not you've done something to tick off the God and you were going to get punished for it. You know where you stand. If you've done something, this is what you do, uh, which the order would have been tremendously helpful for these slave people. Uh, so that's kind of like a, a an overview of those seven seven sacrifices. Did anybody have any questions at this point? Because what's next? We're going to go into the detail of each one of those uh, those five sacrifices uh, in Leviticus one to seven. Anybody have any questions? I don't have a question, but I was just thinking about you know if you take a bunch of people like that's been uh, slaves for years and over their whole life. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what it'd be all of a sudden to be be free? How they would act in freedom. Mm -hmm. They would not. They would know how to act themselves. Yeah. How would you act? All of a sudden, you're free. What would you do with that freedom? Mm -hmm. How would they, how would they act? How would they know to act? Right. Yeah. I. I. It, that. Uh, Bob said. How. How would they know what to do? How would do they handle the freedom? How would you know? I, I think of a, a prisoner uh, serving their time. Uh, or somebody in the military serving and, and coming home or being set free and trying to transition into freedom after living a difficult, you know, a very, very difficult in the prison, in the military, completely different ends of the spectrum, but incredibly diff difficult seasons of life. A prisoner wouldn't know how to transition back. That's the reason why they have all of these transitional stages for people who have, who have been in prison and military we know how difficult it was for people that served in, in vietnam uh, the transition back just did not work for a lot of people uh, and you're right they, they, these slaves would not know how to handle freedom and i believe that leviticus and exodus and numbers and deuteronomy the torah would have been given to these people based on where they were uh, god met them where they were uh, sacrifices were already going on in that world. That was the connectivity to the gods. So God didn't create animal sacrifices. Yahweh didn't invent this. This was already in existence. All the other gods in the primitive world did all of these blood, guts, and fire things. God met these people in such a way to say, I am different. We're going to use you where you are, using the rituals that you are familiar with, with your understanding of life in the world and we're going to meet you there and i'm going to teach you how i'm different uh, i didn't know until years uh just recent years that god didn't create the animal sacrifices I just made an assumption in fact these group of people are much later to the party in human civilization these are these guys aren't the first nation these guys there's other nations all the way around the world by this particular time they're slave people and all these other nations that you read about in Genesis, uh, all these other nations are already developed. Uh, they are already worship their gods. Uh, so this group of people is set apart and different and worships a different God, but also worships in a different way using the language that 
makes sense for those people. And so when you look at the Old Testament, it's not like directly linear in the sense this happens, this happens, this happens. It's, it's a progression. God meets people where they are and speaks the language with development that they're at. And so God uh, changes things throughout the Old Testament. And you can see that uh, because the people are changing. They're growing and they're maturing. Uh, and the greatest example of this, and I know I need to get back to topic on hand here, but uh, Paul calls the law, the Torah, a babysitter uh, in Galatians. And so you think about it, there were very but as they grow up, as human society grew up, eventually God felt like that was that for that time, and now Jesus, it's time for Jesus. I don't understand how all that works, but we have to understand people are progressing and they're growing. And, you, you know, oftentimes I think and I, it's probably wrong, but in my mind to try to understand how different these people were, I think of, you know, cavemen, I, the, their, their ability to communicate and live in society is much different than ours. So, and, and I know these people aren't cavemen by no means. Society has developed through thousands of years, but um, they're primitive, I guess is the way to say it ancient they live life different so god met them where they are all right so let's let's uh let's jump into uh the the first sacrifice which is the burnt offering and um the word for burnt um means to go up and smoke and so there was something about taking an animal and burning it and it, having it transformed to smoke that was incredibly important in that society. So the purpose of the burnt offering was to give something to God, not to receive it. Uh, so in Leviticus chapter 1, there's instructions on how for people to come to the tent of meeting, to meet with a priest, and to perform a sacrifice, a burnt offering. And anyone could come. This is for everybody. And so what they would do, there was three types of animals that be, could be used for a burnt offering. There was uh, from the herd, which would have been cows, uh, bulls, and they would have been very valuable. Uh, they would have been for the rich people and uh, rich of the slaves, which is really hard. to. God's telling these people that you're going to be uh, in the future, as you move towards the promised land, as you get to the promised land, you're going to have these animals. Uh, he's, he's showing them that you, that at time, you, you will have wealth. So the first uh, animals from the, from the herd, and that's the verses 3 through 9. It talks about the sacrifice from the herd. And then it goes to verses 10 through 13 in chapter 1. It talks about the flock, which would have been sheep and goats, which would have been not as wealthy as bulls, but it would have been a step down. And we do know in Israel's history that they did a lot of more shepherds. So goats and flocks would have been kind of a middle income sacrifice. And then it talks about birds and birds would have been for people of lower income. And I think the, and that's verses 14, 17 for lower income. And the, some of the instructions are different based on the animals. And I'll go through some of the instructions here, but uh, uh, the point I want to make is, it doesn't matter if you're rich or in the middle or the poor, you can give a gift to this God. He meets you where you are. And all three of those animals, uh, it, it, the, the goal is uh, a pleasing aroma to the God. In other words, the poor person can come and do a sacrifice and it'll please God. And a rich person will. And people in the middle. So God's setting things up different for this group of people. Anybody can please God. Everybody can please God. In this anybody, I mean, it's it's not just the Jewish people. It's foreigners who got somehow connected. It's refugees who've kind of said, hey, I want in. It's men and women. And I mean, it's everybody that's a part of this big monster group of people can bring a bull, a, a uh, goat, or a, a bird. It, do, it doesn't matter. Uh, some of the things that are in there, um, it just uh, it was helpful to, for me the 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 donor the the slave the set free slave would bring the animal to the altar and would lay hands on the head of the animal which would have communicated ownership so this is this is my gift i put my hand on this 
and then the the donor would have had to slaughter the animal. Uh, now I can't imagine ever doing that. Me either. But that was that world, and I'm grateful that I don't live in that world. But that was it was to in order to give the gift, it required something of you. Uh, it wasn't an easy thing. Uh, number one, the value of the animal you were sacrificing. You, you're you're just a, a set free slave. You have nothing. So this gift is pretty much everything. And uh, and so you are required. Then what the priest does? Uh, this is where the priest. So this is a these sacrifices are a joint partnership between the priest and the, the donor, the Israelite. Um, which from the animal blood equals life and would take the blood and return it to God, would take the blood and pour it out or drip it. And that was returning this life to God as a gift. And then the donor, I know this is, this is gross, would have to flay the animal and then would have to wash the animal in specific places that would be closer to um, uh, refuge, uh, you know, um, uh, the places that are closer to discharge. Uh, and those would have to be cleaned because you want to make sure that the animal before it's burnt is clean. And then, Pastor, yeah. Are you saying the person that brought the, the, the animal or whatever, they're the one that had to kill it? Uh -huh. And they're the one that had to cut it up? Uh -huh. I thought the priest did that. The priest takes the blood. Now, it changes. Some of the sacrifices change, but the first one, the first one, the donor has to slaughter the animal, and then the priest takes the blood from the animal. Because the blood is life, priests do this part. And then the, then the, the donor has to uh, do certain things, and then the priest is the one who takes the animal and puts it and burns it. So Even it's a, the woman had to do that too? Well, I, you know what? I did not read on gender roles, but from my understanding, the, everyone, the word everyone made it available to everyone. Now, whether it was a male that represented the woman, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's not terrible. Well, the, the heartache of actually doing that, of killing the best of your herd to give to God is a, is a big part of the sacrifice itself. I mean, if you just took your best and said, okay, give this to God, and you didn't go through the act of having to destroy your own best, I don't think it'd be as meaningful. I agree. I never knew that. I always thought the priest did that, and we just... The people just brought the animal to the priest, yeah. and he took that animal and killed it and did it. And that was your gift because you gave it to the priest, and he was the one. Yeah. I didn't know that you had to do it. Yeah, that's a partnership. The oh, priest had their part, and the person had their part. And the goal was, remember the I goal. i never heard that before. Yeah. The goal is for everybody to eventually become a priest. So... It's a transitional, the, the, the person is doing their part, the priest is doing their part in modeling what the priest does. So eventually, and again, it's weird because it's sacrifices, but the whole idea of a priest is someone who is showing the rest how to be priestly or holy. And uh, so this partnership is, is between God and uh, this, this gift is a partnership between the priesthood and the person who's making the gift, uh, which is very strange. And I can't imagine being a part of it, but I think as Jonathan says, he hit it on that. So, so let's say you have $1,000 in your checking account. I'd love to have $1,000 in my checking account. But let's say I did. And I uh, wanted to give a gift of God of 900 of it. That would hurt, right? That would hurt. And I think the thing here we have to understand is that is their income. That's all they had. That was their property. So they're giving away their very best. Uh, even if you're a poor person and you, you caught a bird, I, I mean, that, that effort was your time and your, I mean, it was your being that you were giving away as a gift. Uh, and it required something of us. Uh, it was costly. The gift cost. What's that? I think too, it was a faith-based decision. Yeah. Because if all I have is a few birds and I got to pick the best one, excuse yeah. me. I got to pick the best one that I spent time and energy and money to feed and groom and care for. And, you know, my kids think this is the best bird in the world. And right. my wife thinks this is going to sustain us for the next year. And all of a sudden I say, no, we got to give this to God. Yeah. You know, it's, we, we can liken it to money now, but if that's all you have, 
That's it. And or you've got three birds, and, and you've got, you got two scrawny birds and one really good one, and you've got to pick the good one that might have carried you through another season. Or, you know, you just don't know. It would have been the one that you were going to use to breed with. But I can you, see you giving it, it up, but I can't see killing it. I mean, I can see giving it happily and joyfully, mm -hmm. but I can't see take up a knife and kill that mm -hmm. and then cut it up. I, I've never heard that before, mm -hmm. and it's just like, oh my. Yeah, yeah well, it's just, I can't see myself doing that. Yeah, I, but if I, it was required of you, you would have to do that. But the but the something. interesting thing in this sacrifice, this is completely optional. Man, this is this is a gratitude offer. This particular one, in fact, the first three are. So you, you wouldn't have to do this, but God provides a way for you to give back based on the world. And then we live in a different world, and I'm grateful because I could never harm anybody. I am the most pacifist person that you're going to come across. So uh, to actually do that would be, it would be severe. It would pull me into a place that I've not been before. And maybe that's that's what this is about. Again, it's not about violence because it's this, this God isn't about violence, but this God uses what the language that these people knew, which is animal sacrifice. Um, as you see, he provides the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus, so there doesn't need to be any more sacrifices because God despises the sacrificial system because God doesn't want any animals to die, right? Because they're his creation. So God provides his own sacrifice, so we don't have to do that. And so Jesus kind of did it for you, Linda, so you don't have oh, to ever do so it. Well, thank you. <laughs> so you never have to do it. Um, so this isn't about, you know, first sacrifice, we have... Um, you know, the herd, the flock, the birds, different classes of income can give all to this God. This God's not angry. He desires relationship. This is the God that hears the cries of the people. Uh, and so he provides a way for people to do a burnt offering uh, to, as a way of saying thank you to God. And so there's kind of the first chapter. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of details in this. And I mean, there's some details. I don't I mean, I have no clue. I have no idea what that means. Commentaries, people like scholars and stuff will say. We have no idea because we didn't live then. I mean, we don't know why, you know, some of these details. But I think the key for me is, is understanding that God didn't create the sacrificial system, that God met them using the sacrificial system that they would have known about and transitions it to something that's different. Um, just the first three, it starts with joy. This God wants you to rejoice. He doesn't want you to start with guilt. He starts with joy. So the second one is the grain offering, and this there's all these different ways to cook bread, basically. Um, and I think that uh, the first three verses talk about uncooked wheat. The, verses 4 through 10 talked about cooked wheat, and then there's special instructions about what you can include in the bread. And then the chapter ends with natural barley. The last theory. So these are ins instructions. Now, I, what I got out of reading this chapter and studying this chapter is that, you know, for the, so those people that couldn't, didn't have animals, uh, they didn't have a bull, a cow, they didn't have goats or, or a sheep and didn't have birds. Uh, this was maybe even for the poorest of person, they could break, bake bread and give it to this God. Um, and it still produced a pleasing uh, aroma. In other words, so God was just as pleased with the bull as he was the bread. Oh, I take the bread. I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. So I take the bread. And that's different. In other society, remember we talked about the ordering of the Egyptians. There was a top. And the top were better than the bottom. You know? And, and that's the way the world worked. And I would say that that is a disordering of what God intended. In our world, which is the same as the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the rich at times can abuse the poor, I do not think that's what God intended. And this is a recreating of that. He is providing a way. He's acknowledging that people are going to have different incomes. That's part of society. But everyone can worship. And so if all you could do was bring bread, there are some commands in here about no um, yeast, uh, no honey, uh, and use salt. So the no yeast and no honey are um, fermenting materials. And in that world, at least in the commentaries, it talked about these materials of yeast 
and honey because of the sugar ferment or change that leads something to death. So they says do not use, just like in the Old Testament with the Passover bread, don't use uh, yeast. Uh, yeast is symbolic of sin. Uh, in this way, both of those items change the offering. Um, salt is always tied to a salt covenant. When you pour salt into something because of the value of the salt, you are making a commitment, just like we do salt ceremonies here, salt covenants from time to time here at our church. It's a way of saying, I'm in. And so adding salt to the bread was a way to say to God that I'm, I'm giving, again, just like you give of your best, uh, you're giving of something that is a commitment to you. Uh, so the grain offering is what some commentaries say would be uh, for those who come for a bird. And I think that's important. This God allows everybody to worship. Uh, that's chapter two. And how much time? Oh, we got to run. We got to go. All right. So chapter three is the peace offering. Um, and the Hebrew word is shalomim, which uh, is very close to shalom. And so that's the reason why this offering is named the peace offering. This is because your life is good. You have peace with God. And so you want to provide a meal for God. Uh, so this one's a little bit different. This is giving God food, not because um, he needs to eat the animal, uh, which would be like other gods. This God's hungry, so he demands your sacrifices. That was very familiar ideas. This God's different. This God wants to have a meal with you. And so this third offering is is almost i i feel connected to god in such a way i want to bring an animal and have a meal in this particular offering the actual the priest and the donor would eat together they would sit there with the sacrifice and eat the meal together as a way of shalom which really is neat because you think about all the times that jesus ate with people and so this is this idea that god is willing to have, share a meal with these people they could draw near bring a gift of food a meat for the table basically and the priest can eat some the donor can eat some and the rest of it symbolically we're presenting to god to share in our table meal i think that's awesome and so the first three are all about this relationship uh and he goes through a lot of different things and i'm, I'm not talks about fat and the fat is the most flavorful part so god gets the fat Right, that doesn't make sense to me. But when I'm smoking stuff, I'm on the smoker. I like, you know, beef brisket. The fat is the best part, right? Because that's where the flavor is. It's not good for you, but in that world, the fat was given to God because they recognize that's where flavor was. And so, if you're sharing a meal with God and wanting to sit at the table together, so to speak, they wanted to give God the fat, the most flavorful part, because He's the guest of honor. Um, and so these, I want to just talk a little bit about um, these first three real quick. Uh, these, the encounter with God begins with voluntary gifts. Uh, the motivation for coming into God's presence to coming into the tent of meeting is joy, not obligation. Uh, it's about bringing gift of celebration, not of duty, gift, guilt, or shame. Uh, it's how do these slave people who have been set free, how do they give back to the God who set them free? Um, it, it, but it also, it points to their future. Here's these poor people who don't have anything that were slaves. They're eventually going to have bulls and sheep and, and birds, and they're going to be able to bake bread. They're going to have these things. Maybe when this first took place, the average person didn't have them. Uh, God's painting a picture of a day when you get to the promised land, you're going to have these things. Um, and so there's a time when these people eventually will settle down in the promised land and they'll be able to raise herds and flocks and plant and offer gifts of things they possess and things they produce that would have brought joy. It's like somebody painting a picture for one of us or our kids and saying, hey, one day you, you, you're going to be able to do this and you're going to be able to go here. And this is what life is going to be. So God, even in the very early stages, is giving these people hope. One day you will have these things, um, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but it did require their best but it was a happy relinquishment of their very best. It was joyful. In our world, oftentimes, our offerings are surrounded by guilt and shame. I give because I'm supposed to give, or I'm giving because um, I'm expected to give. And these people gave because they were joyful. 
And that's a challenge to me uh, in a world that I, there's so many conveniences that I have that when I re relinquish one of them, it seems to be with dread. <laughs> Here, God, you can have Netflix. <laughs> you know, it's like the end of the world, right? Uh, but, uh, it, and I, I, I make fun of it because that's, that's where it is. It's like, God, don't ask me to give up my cell phone, but my cell phone's $80 a month, which is ridiculous. So you think through giving a gift back to God. I don't know what that is for us today, but even if let's say it's financial, uh, I don't, I, I, joy is a question I have to challenge myself with. Am I joyful? Am I giving these people because they were set free from slavery? They're joyful. We've been set free because of Christ from the slavery to sin. And I, the challenge that I'm wrestling with is, am I as joyful as these people were joyful? Because ultimately, slavery in the Bible points. Uh, am I joyful? The other thing that's pretty cool about it is that, the, like you said, the levels of the grain and the meat and going on up and up and up. If you were on the upper, you weren't giving what was, what was no. okay to give if you were at the lower. That's how we Absolute. get more and more and more. We want to give back the same amount that we used to when we didn't have. And so the more you have, the more sacrifice you should be giving. And it all comes from God anyway. He provided you with uh, with the, the gift that you were going to give back to him. He's not asking you to give him a bull if all you have is grain. Right. So. Oh, uh, Juan just hit it. Hit it is each one of those levels, as we increase in income, we give based upon the income. So uh, we don't continue with the same gift as we receive more resources. We give more because it's all God's anyway. Juan, thank you. That's good. All right. So we got a couple minutes just to talk about the, um, the fourth and the fifth. Um, so Leviticus 4 is the sin offering. And what's interesting about this for me uh, is it's when you do something to somebody unintentionally. So you hurt somebody, but you didn't mean to really hurt somebody, but you did. Um, there's an offering for that. Uh, it's a sin of commission. Uh, it's, uh, and so they introduce it by talking about the sin, but then they say, well, if the anointed priest sins, so if Aaron, which we'll talk about him next week, if Aaron would sin, then uh, this what is what happens. And it's interesting, if Aaron would sin, then he brings guilt upon the entire community because he represents God. And through the Bible, there's always this heavy responsibility on uh, people who represent God, like priests or, or teachers. There's a higher requirement. And because if, if a teacher or a priest would sin, it affects the entire community. And how many churches do you see or do you hear when the pastor has a moral failure? What happens to the church? It destroys the church, right? Not, I mean, the, there's a heavy weight upon the priest. And that's built into this. Even he, even though he wants everybody to be a priest, he starts by taking a select few to be a priest to show them what it means to be a priest. And so, um, the, and then in verses 13 in chapter 4, if the whole community of Israel sins unintentionally, uh, it talks about when a ruler or anyone, ordinary people sins. And then he goes in the beginning part of chapter five. So chapter four, the four sacrifice sin offering kind of bleeds into the first 13 verses of chapter five, kind of almost like an appendix. And uh, it, it gives some rules for uh, by what people say and, and, and what people don't say uh, and boundaries between people. And uh, it requires them because these are uh, unintentional sins to confess that they have sinned, which I find fascinating. So Bob, let's say I hurt you. I didn't mean to hurt you, but it comes out that I did hurt you. I have to confess that I hurt you. How many people struggle with the, the, the idea that, well, if I didn't think I sinned, if I didn't think I hurt Bob, why do I have to confess that I hurt Bob? This is something completely different. This is about society. God knows he wants Bob and I to have a great relationship. But if I hurt Bob's feelings, if I do something that violates Bob's life, and again, we're talking about ancient primitive stuff. If I lie to Bob, if I do these and didn't mean to, but if I, then I need to say it out loud 
in front of the entire community. I need to bring an animal sacrifice because I have done something, even though not I didn't intend to do it, I've disrupted society. Because I've disrupted the community of people, I'm responsible to bring a sacrifice to make amends amongst the people. That's crazy. Is that everybody? Yeah. Are yeah. you talking about all the people? All the people. What if you hurt my feelings and you didn't know you hurt my feelings? Well, then that would be a completely different story. But if it came out that I hurt your feelings, and again, I, I, I'm exaggerating the point because there's a lot of details on what, who, how. But the point is society is the deal. Community is the deal. God's providing a way for people to make amends, to reconcile. Nowadays, if I don't feel like I've done anything wrong, I'm not going to apologize, right? If I, don't, if, I don't, if I didn't do anything wrong, I'm talking from that stubbornness that rises up within us. I didn't let my house, right? And there's fights, there's arguments. God's saying, no, 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 no. Even if you unintentionally did something, you've affected the society of the group of people. Here's a way to make amends. Here's a way to say, I'm sorry. And, and the thing about these things is they just don't affect society. They affect God too. And so the sacrifice is to God, not just to make things right between me and God. It's, it's the point is to make us together again as a family. Um, and so if you think about it from that perspective, all of these weird things are in there because God wants this group of people to be a family. He doesn't want them to be a society where one person wrongs another person and nothing's done and they can cover it up. And you know how many people leave churches, will leave a church and never say a word? And I find that mind-boggling to me. Because you get the feelings of it. Yeah. I just heard that last Sunday. Yeah. And somebody's not coming here now because they got the feelings of it. Yeah. I just heard that last Sunday because I asked somebody where their wife was at. Yeah. So she's not coming back, but she got a feelings of it. Yeah. But they wouldn't tell me how she got her feelings of it. Yeah. And, and so, and this isn't to throw blame on anybody, but in our society, it is easier not to deal with something. It's harder to confess. I'm sorry, Bob, for what I did. I, got, I hurt your feelings. And it's harder for the other person to reconcile with that. And so God, in the very beginning, is providing a way for people to come together and not hold their bitterness apart. That makes sense? That same thing happens in families, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. And the person says, well, I did nothing to offend that person or for them to be acting that way, so I'm not going to apologize. And then the family falls breaks apart or you only get to this part of the family and then some people can go to this side and be okay and go to that side and be okay but the ones that are not okay make it to where the whole family can't get back together again until it gets right absolutely so it it affects one person's decision not to reconcile affects the whole group of people and their ability to have relationship between them and uh when you bring up a great point Juan, it's in families it's in churches and again it's God's trying in the very beginning of setting up a society of slaves that have been set free, trying to develop a way for them to be a family, to reconcile when they've done wrong. Um, and then the fifth offering is in the second half of chapter five is a guilt offering. Uh, it's uh, more ways to do what we just talked about with the sin offering the guilt offering are ways to where it talks about robbery and uh, lying and defrauding. And uh, if you found something that somebody lost and you lie about it so you can keep it, uh, these are all society type of things. Um, it's a way for you to bring an offering to God to make things right between you and God and you and the person. So even though these seem very primitive sacrificial type slaughtering of animals. God is using uh, a way that they're familiar with to make, to, to foster a healthy relationship between God and the people and the people with one another. Um, whatever the sin that takes place, it disrupts the relationship with God and it diminishes the people's capacity to be the way they were created to be. So sin leaves a mark not only on the people, but also on the group as a whole. And uh, there's different levels of sin in, in this particular society. Uh, 
when individuals do something, it pollutes the outer altar, and then the priest must clean the outer altar. Unintentional sins of the high priest are more severe, so the blood has to be poured into the holy place, the outer part of the inner sanctum. And then when there's, un, when there's intentional unrepented sins, and we'll talk about this in Leviticus 16, 17, once a year they had the Day of Atonement where uh, the high priest would take the blood of uh, an animal into the most holy place and cleanse it, and that set things right. It's very interesting, almost like in Leviticus, sin is like a virus that's very contagious, that affects everybody, and it must be cured, it must be cleansed. And I see it. I see it in society. Don't you? Sin is like a virus. It spreads. And God's providing a way for, through the sacrificial system. It's interesting, the, the fourth one, purification means cleansing. It's like God's providing a way for that virus to be cured. Ultimately, Jesus is the cure of sin. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. And sin is a virus. John Wesley says sin is a disease, and it has to be taken care of or it will destroy you. But the key in here, it doesn't just destroy you. It destroys your family. It destroys your neighbors. It destroys your entire society. And remember, these people are camped out outside the tent of meeting by family, the 12 tribes, all the way around in this tabernacle. It's in the middle of it all. And so they have to come to God, and what they do uh, between each other affects the relationship with God and affects their relationship one to another. Uh, it is after one, so we, we just kind of had some fun talking about sacrifices. Just real quick, chapter 6 and 7 are instructions to the priest to do those first five sacrifices. So the five sacrifices are in the first five chapters. Chapter 6 and 7 are instructions to the priest. This is how you administer these five sacrifices that you just communicated to the whole people. And so 6 and 7 are priestly instructions. So there's so much repetition. And you might go, I don't like reading repetition, but repetition is helpful. In an oral society where no one read, and you know, you, you, how else do you learn by repeating? And so things are repeated over and over and over and over. And these slaves didn't know how to read. And so if they would stand up and repeat all these instructions, it would eventually get up in here. And so that's the reason why there's so much repetition of animals and blood and guts and fire. It's because they needed to remember it. And so God repeated it. Um, so the, the Jesus part of this, um, the Jesus part of this is when they, uh, an interesting little nugget, when the priests made the five sacrifices, after they've made these five sacrifices, they would say it is finished. thought that was really interesting. So if they would do the burnt offering and then the grain offering, and they would do these in sequence within their worship. And after all of the sacrifices have been made all in order of those five in order. The high priest would say it is finished. It's a cultural thing. Of course, when Jesus died on the cross, the last words that he said, or one of the last phrases he said is it is finished. Uh, John chapter one uh, says the word became flesh and tabernacled, dwelled with people. And so there's this picture in the New Testament of this scene of the tabernacle, that God dwells with man, that Jesus is the tabernacle in his life. Um, Romans chapter 12 talks about us presenting ourselves as living sacrifices. And so we have the opportunity to present ourselves just like those people did uh, present their, their bull and their grain and their goats and their, we, we, we here all, here's all I have. And I'm joyful. I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice. Um, Jesus was uh, just like they took the, the bad parts of the animal, bad parts of the sacrifice, and they put it outside the camp. Jesus was killed outside the city where they put the garbage. Uh, you know, there's some definite tie-ins here. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So we're talking about all these sacrifices. But Jesus offered himself as a living sacrifice, joyful to his Father <clears throat> for us. Uh, so yeah, hey, that's the first seven chapters. Uh, we could go a lot deeper in these things. Uh, but hopefully uh, this little overview of sacrifice helped you understand that uh, these people, these slaves that were set free, didn't start with guilt and shame. They started with joy and gratefulness. And God, God provided a way for this group of people to worship him. Everybody could get in on it. And also uh, he provided a way for this group of people to be a family. 
And so wrongs should be righted and sorted out in this ancient so that they could be family. I'm hoping that today that uh, you learned something uh, that affects you. I don't want to talk just facts because facts are worthless uh, if it doesn't affect our relationship with God. But I find that I learn more about God when I go deep in the Old Testament, places that I, I misjudged him. Uh, he's not the angry God that many people make him out to be in the Old Testament. He's a God of joy and provides a way for people like us who are set free from sin and death to be joyful and to give gifts back to him. Uh, would you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer to close us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I was just praying that, and I was thinking, trespasses, all of this connects on it, right? Hey, grace and peace, everybody. Take care. I'll see you next week as we get into chapters 8 to 10. See ya.